Good morning, and welcome back to the Instant Maximum Particle Short Course. Our next lecturer will be Tom Watts, talking about validation methods. Tom is hailing from Rockefeller University. He is a lifelong champion of CryoEM, and he has used many different modalities within the field of CryoEM. I think one of the first sub-2 angstrom reconstructions for a very, very long time was solved by Tom using 2D crystallography, and such that it showed that not only is single particle the method to use, there are other modalities within EM that can bring really good information to bear on your problem. Something also that he has used to great effect is negative stain. So you hear a lot about cryo, you hear a lot about other things, but different questions require different answers. And what you'll find out is that what's most important is are you getting the information you need? Is it a correct model? Does it create better hypotheses for you to push forward. And Tom will talk about that. This is the champion of Crowley. So I'm not going to talk about that. Okay. <laughs> I'm overselling everything. Um, so the first time I was asked to talk in this course was about five years ago. And maybe at that time, validation methods still meant something. But quite honestly, at this point, I don't feel validation methods are that important anymore. And so the subtitle to my presentation is a blast on the past. And so <coughs> a, a dark secret, and now it's not working anymore. For a long time, a dark secret in a single poly electron microscopy was that the really great thing about EM is that you can use pretty much any data set that you collect and process it any way that you want, and you will get a structure out of it. So that's really great about EM. What is really bad about EM is that you can take almost any data set and process it in any way you want and you will get a map out of it. So the problem then becomes the map that you got, is it actually correct or is it just complete nonsense? And that used to be a really big problem early on. Um, this sounds very loud to me, but anyway. So the problem was really when it was still globology and we had very low resolution density maps and you could always, if the density map that you got did not represent what you were expecting, it just postulated there was a conformational change in the protein, so that's why the map looks different. So it was a real problem and to demonstrate this, um, these are, this is a very famous case. This is in the early 2000s and that's when I kind of started my group around this time and there were four maps of exactly the same protein called IP3 receptor. And the only thing that is the same between these four maps is that they're all four foot symmetric, and the reason is that was imposed during the image processing. Other than that, at least three of the maps are wrong. And it turned out all of them were wrong. So that was a problem at the beginning when you got these low resolution maps and you couldn't really decide this is a correct map or, or, or not. And so what I'm supposed to talk about is how do you decide whether your map is correct or not. Nowadays, most of your data will go at least to better than 10 angstrom. So you will start to see alpha helices. So the moment you see alpha helices, you can be pretty much sure that the map that you got is correct, at least in the part where you see alpha helices. So map validation at this point is not nearly as important as it used to be when you couldn't see any two, uh, secondary structure elements. And so rather than for me to talk for a long time about how do you validate maps at low resolution, which you actually virtually never get anymore, I thought I'd do just a talk about the entire process of single poly reactor microscopy, and you will hear a lot of the same principles that you just heard very nicely from Rich. It's very similar, in my views, uh, as Rich views of the field. And so I'll just take you very quickly through the, 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 the steps in, in the uh, single poly electron microscopy. You start with your cells, you purify your protein. And then once you have your protein, um, you prepare grids. Obviously, because you have to prepare your protein for the vacuum of the microscope, you don't want to dehydrate the protein. So these days, you do vitrification. Um, then you take images and you get your 2D images and because you have a problem with beam damage you're, you will have very few electrons that you use so you will get very noisy images. So now you have to try to get better signal to noise ratio and you have to try to reconstruct a three-dimensional dimension because your images are just two-dimensional. 
So first of all, you pick your particles, you align them to each other, and then when you have homogeneous sets, you can calculate 2D averages, and these 2D averages will now have a much better signal-to-noise ratio. Now you can combine these 2D averages into an initial 3D model, and so you end up with your initial 3D map. And these days, you can actually forego the 2D averages, and you can pretty much take your big particles and go directly to an initial model. But in the beginning, your um, orientation parameters are more or less just a guess, so you have a very bad map. So you have to refine um, your orientation parameters and also to perform 3D classification if you have different um, conformations. And so you end up with your final 3D map. So that's the actual data collection, data processing. And once you have these 3D maps, you can interpret them either by docking crystal structures or by building them over a new model. And so what I'm supposed to talk about is how do you validate that the 3D maps are correct. What I'm not going to talk about today is how you actually validate the 3D models that you pretty much do these days, very similar as in X-ray models. But my view is the better job you do with all these individual steps, if you optimize and validate all these steps, then this map it has a much better chance to be correct than if you really just make a mess up here. And so the general principle, which is true for everything, is if you put junk in here, what you will get out here is also junk. And so my principle philosophy has always been you try to optimize every single step before you move on to the next step. And so what I'm going to talk about is what we kind of look at each of the different steps where we have to be careful. And like with Rich, whenever you have a question, just talk about it, ask me. It's the same principle. I don't really want, need to go through all the slides because most of it you actually already heard from Rich. What I'm going to talk about is just a reiteration, more or less, of what Rich just said. And so you start out with your purification of your protein. And there you can have all kinds of problems. You have most the heterogeneity, which Rich already mentioned, which can be compositional or conformational. Conformational heterogeneity can be between discrete states, which is easy where you can have continuous movements of individual domains, and that's much, much more difficult to deal with. And then another thing that people have already mentioned, we do cross-linking to try, especially with multi-subunit complexes, to keep the complexes together. But cross-linking can actually create problems for you. And as Rich said, and I will show you, you should look at your protein with and without cross-linking. And so my principle, with any sample that comes to my lab, whether we produce it ourselves or we get it from a collaborator, we always try to understand what the sample actually is. We want to understand how heterogeneous it is, is it well prepared. And so my method and my group, I always do negative state electron microscopy. And these days, you hear, hardly hear anything about negative state electron microscopy. And when people try, they actually find it very difficult and they don't get much information. However, if you really do decent magnet stain, you can learn a hell of a lot about your specimen. And so the nice thing about negative staining of your specimen is that you absorb it to a carbon layer, and that often induces it to get the protein in a single or very few con uh, orientations on your grid. And also because you have negative stain, you have heavy metal, you get a fairly good contrast of your specimens. And therefore, if you now look at the specimen, you can assess heterogeneity very easily because you have them always in the same orientation, so if they look different, you most likely have some heterogeneity. If you can't see it in the raw images, just take a few images, calculate averages. These days, it takes you less than a day to pick particles to do 2D class averages. And they will tell you if differences that you see in your projection are different orientation, which you can still have in negative state, or whether you have different, have to, uh, different conformational states. And if you understand this already on your sample level, you know what to do once you go into cryogen and do classification. It really helps you understand the sample. And so my principle is always, especially if you start with a new protein that you don't know the structure, you try to do whatever you can to minimize the degree of heterogeneity. You can change the buffer conditions, you can try cross-linking, you can use um, substrates, products, cofactors, whatever you can, especially in the beginning when you need a new structure, try to get the heterogeneity as small as possible. And then when you have done all you can and you still have a very heterogeneous specimen, 
you can try to do chemical fixation, especially for multi-sovial complexes. But what I always say, there's nothing wrong, it's a great technique to do cross-linking, but check what it actually does to your protein. And again, negative staining is a very good method to look at what cross-linking does to your protein. And so this is one example. This is a, is a tablet complex called HOPS that was um, uh, published, and this is a negative stain image of your HOPS complex. And it looks very homogeneous, looks great, so you can make 2D, pro 2D averages, and all these 2D averages look more or less the same. So that's very nice. The only problem, it has nothing to do with the protein. So if you don't cross-link this protein, it looks much, much messier. It's a real mess. And so you have to take a lot of images and then you do two averages, but then you see that you actually don't have these two bilobal domains. You have an actual protein with a lot of different legs that do different things. But once you do cross-linking, you just glue all these legs onto the body together, and you can get a nice structure, but it just doesn't mean anything biologically. Yes? So how do you kind of a just bulk cross-linking or things like graphics? So anything you want to do. So graphics, I have to say, so far for every sample that I looked at gives the best results. Graphics is a fantastic technique. But again, if you would apply graphics to this math to this complex, you just don't get the right structure. So if you have a big complex, any complex that is mostly globular, graphics usually works very well. In, my, in our hand, it works better than just adding a little bit of cross-linking to the solution. It also works better than on-column cross-linking. So I love graphics. There's really nothing wrong. Just make sure that it doesn't change the structure dramatically. When you say it works better, mm -hmm. what do you mean exactly? Um, <coughs> so what graphics does is not just cross-linking, but it also separates your nice complex from crappy complexes. So you get a very nice consistent cross-linking, and then if you do images of vitrification, you actually can get a good structure. Well, if you just cross-link in solution, or in our case also on-column cross-linking, it's still much more heterogeneous than if you do greater. It might also be that the glycerol helps you to keep it together while you cross-link it. I don't know what it is, but graphics is really a fantastic method for cross-linking. Many complexes that we work on, which are labeled, we actually do graphics. I think Holger Schunk always says that, uh, so they have done some calculations that the amount of force that the molecules feel on the gradient is much less than what they experience on the HPLC or HPLC columns, and that's why from one of the reasons. Yeah, that's one of the reasons, but if you just put cross-link in solution, then you have no other force, yeah. but you also don't have very good cross-linking. So I'm a big fan of graphics, just check what it does to your product, and if you will never get the same resolution, but if the overall structure is still the same, then go for it. Um, say you're working with a complex and you know your KD is above the concentration you need to be at to do negative stain. Because mm -hmm. you need to dilute <laughs> to do negative stain. Mm -hmm. Are there good ways around that issue? Not good no. ones. <laughs> <laughs> so there are different things you can do. Um, you can try to minimize the glow discharge of your grid so that much fewer particles will absorb. Another thing that somebody actually developed, which I thought was very cool, it just never worked for me, is that you put your sample at high concentration. So first you have a pipette, you suck up a little bit of negative stain, and then you have a little bit of a break, and then you suck up your sample at high concentration, and then you just push it through on your grid. So first you have your sample, and then the negative stain comes right away, and it goes, never worked for me. But the idea is great, and it worked for them. <laughs> so but it's, it's really usually we just then cross-link and then it off the cross-linking. Um, so cross-linking is great. Just check what, do you, what it does to your sample. So the next thing is specimen preparation. And um, that's vitrification. The issues that the typical issues that almost all of us who have ever done cryogen will experience is that you don't see your particles. You have beautiful particles in your negative stain, you put it in two eyes, it's all gone. Or you have nice particles, but they're all in the same orientation. And that because you have to you have to get different views to get a three-dimensional reconstruction, both of these issues are gonna be problematic. 
And so if you have no particles, what typically happens is that your carbon film will suck up all your particles. And I, they like to go to carbon film, they, stuck, they get stuck there. And if you blot your grid, you just everything in the hole goes away. And so people have um, used different approaches to deal with this. To use it just to try to increase the protein concentration. The more sophisticated one is double blotting. The idea is you first put your specimen on the grid. And then you saturate all the binding sites on the carbon. You blot it away. Now you come with the specimen again, so the specimen cannot go on the carbon anymore, so it would actually be trapped in the hose. That sometimes works quite nicely. And then much more common is to try um, some sort of support film, thin carbon films, the graphene oxide have become very popular. But other people have also tried to just simply use different grids or gold grids sometimes to particles like to go in the hole for whatever reason. And that was a nice idea to try to actually pacify the carbon film so that it's the same idea as the double plotting, you just basically cover all the binding sites in the carbon film and then the particles were supposed to go in the hole. This hasn't become very popular, mostly because thin carbon films usually do a really good job in bringing the particles into the hole. And then the other problem is that you have these preferred orientations, and that's because particles like to align to the air-water interface. And it's not that some samples go to the air-water interface and some don't. All of them, these guys here show that pretty much every sample will always go to the air-water interface. But sometimes they actually start to have preferred orientations due to the tension of, this, of the interface. Sometimes they align, sometimes they don't, but when they align, then you end up with these preferred orientations. And so a trick that usually works, or quite often works, is that you really miss a lot of your different views, you cannot end up with an incorrect reading map, especially in olden times. A lot of the bad structures, density maps that were out there was because we had these preferred orientations, we didn't take them into account, and so the density map that we got in the end was actually corrupt, was not good. So it's a real issue. These days you can deal with it much better. And the ways to deal with it is often to just add detergent. The idea is that you change the tension in the air-water interface, and so you get less of an alignment uh, at the surface. And also, thin, thin support layers can actually help you. Because what they do is they keep the particles away from the air-water interface. And so if you're lucky, they absorb to the carbon film in all kinds of different orientations. You freeze it, and you get different orientations because they no longer go to the air-water interface and get it right. So sometimes this actually helps you to prevent um, preferred orientations. And then also, some pe sometimes just using gold grids helps to get different. Other ideas are add components like a fab, a nanobody. Sometimes it helps you also to get different orientations. If none of this helps, yes? What is it about gold grids that seems to prevent? I uh, have no idea. It makes no sense to me. <laughs> but it does work sometimes. Um, it's also sometimes different detergent do a better or worse job. Again, it makes no sense to me. In my view, you just change the surface tension, and what, which exact detergent you use for that shouldn't, shouldn't matter. But sometimes chaps works and try to not it for whatever reason. So that's unfortunate. A lot of things are still very phenomenal, phenomenological, so we see it, but we can't really understand why. We just have to do and try. And that's what Rich said, it's a brute force. Try everything you can think of, and hopefully one of them is actually going to work. In this case, if none of this works, you, the people here again have developed new um, preparation methods, especially Spolidon. In many cases, Spolidon actually helps you to get different orientation. It never helped me. <laughs> it's not magic. So it's very frustrating. Everything that developed here never works for me. <laughs> <laughs> but I know many people, it, does, it makes a big difference and it really helps. And so because Spolidon didn't help us, we then went to a different thing they did here which is you actually tilt your specimen, and you take images of tilted specimens. And that's very, very painful, and you only do it when you absolutely have to. But if you have to, it works these days. So this is one example from a long time ago. This was our ATPAs that we were working on. We got these very nice images. Um, we calculated averages, every single one, every average was exactly the same view. 
And then just simply by adding some detergents, the images don't look as nice anymore, but now we actually get different orientations. And that allowed us to get a three-dimensional map. The one thing that you have to know that you probably have realized, the moment you add detergent to your specimen, you have to opt the concentration of that tenfold. Again, it's not quite clear why. I assume because you have less surface tension, you can actually blot off much more of the protein. But in any case, so the general idea is this what you also observe. You have to actually get about 10 times more protein for any sample that has detergent in it. And that can create a problem if you have specimens that are difficult to concentrate. Like a lot of complexes, when you concentrate, they start to aggregate. So uh, you have to try and see if it works for you. So once you have your grid, um, you take images, you get to the uh, class, uh, to the images. And so the problem with imaging has always been that you get low contrast. And it's difficult to improve the contrast because we have a beam sensitive specimen. So we can't just use as many electrons as we wanted. But this is now really an issue that has gone away. And that's all about the direct detectors. With the introduction of direct detectors, we now can actually get images that have an incredible quality. And so the problem was always that our biological specimens consist of very small atoms, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen. And the scattering of electrons is proportional to the size of the, the atomic number of the, of the atoms in the specimen. So if you have light atoms, you get very little scattering. And so inherently, our biological specimens do not scatter electrons very well. And now you have to get the, distinguish the distinction between your protein, which scatters electrons very poorly, and the buffer that also scatters your electrons. So therefore, the smaller your protein gets, the more difficult it actually becomes to see it, because the difference between scattering of the protein and the buffer is, is so similar. So this has been the problem for all the time. It's been we just never could get very good contracts. So because we have little scattering, so the easiest way to get more scattering is just to mo use more electrons. But if you use more electrons, because our specimen is beam sensitive, we now introduce more and more beam damage. And if you do it too much, you get so much breakage in our, in our molecule that what, uh, what you get in the end doesn't have much to do with the biological molecule anymore. So that has always been the problem. Um, we want to use lots of electrons we can, and so we end up with this very horrible noisy images. And so the idea was, well, we can fix low, low contrast just by averaging and adding more and more images so we can actually improve the signal to noise ratio. What we cannot do is to fix beam damage. Once the protein is damaged, we cannot fix it. And so therefore, we erred on this side. We used very few electrons and got very noisy images. So we got these noisy images, and particles are hard to see, and the smaller protein, if the protein gets too small, you, you really can't see it anymore. So all this has gone away with the direct electron detectors. And the thing is, you can now collect movies, rather than just take an image, we take movies that you can expose as long as you possibly want, and then we just add all these frames together. We can fix the, 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 um, the, the specimen movement. But we can also resolution filter. So we can keep all the resolution in the early frames, but we have very little beam damage. And we can recover and keep all the high resolution information. And as further out we go into exposure, we just cut, up the, cut out the high resolution information, which is damaged. But we can keep the low resolution information. And that's important, because that's very important for all the alignment classification, mostly is on the low resolution information. So now we can actually very nicely align and classify, and then use the high resolution information to get the high resolution features. So the DVD cameras have been really a miracle that has really been uh, the turning point in Singapore direct microscopy. You fix the beam induced movement, you could improve the, 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 the signal to noise ratio, and you could actually recover all the high resolution information. And because you now have so much signal to noise in your images, all these image processing algorithms that were around for a long time but never worked very well because the signal to noise ratio was so bad. Now with these new quality data, everything started to work. And so the direct detectors had a much higher impact than anybody expected just because all the image processing became so much better now. So 
imaging is pretty much solved at this point. Um, you can still try to get slightly better detectors, but they're fairly close at what they can do. Face plates have kind of had a, a, an upcoming, but they're not working all that well so far. So, but with the images that you get at this point, we, will, we, we are able to get very high resolution images. So imaging is no longer a problem. So now once you have images, you have to pick the particles that you can then align and calculate to the class averages. And the problem with, with particle picking is that you can introduce a model bias. And the same is true once you do two D classification, you have to deal with or you have to be you have to worry about model bias. And then there are other issues that are no longer that important actually. So what is um, reference bias? And so there's a very nice example where you take a thousand noisy images. So this is white noise, there's nothing in these images, pure noise. And now you take a thousand images with nothing in it, and you take as reference what would I say? And you align these thousand images, which have nothing in them, and you align them to your reference, which is all with Einstein, and what you get is a very noisy version of your reference. And that's reference bias. And that can be a big problem because all our data is very noisy, so you can actually start to just align noise and get your, get your structure, which is basically just what your reference was. And you might think that this is not a big issue, but it is a big issue because uh, not that long ago, this, this study came out, which had a lot of, lot of issues. At the beginning, they thought they had a structure of 1.9 angstrom, which was total nonsense. So then they went down to about 8 angstrom or 6 angstrom, and they published it. And so those, those are the images that they took of this envelope protein of HIV. And um, you can clearly see the particles. I couldn't, but they could clearly see the particles. And then they calculated averages, and the averages looked amazing, absolutely, utterly amazing, especially if you think the raw images look like this. And so a lot of people had issues with this structure. Is anybody aware of this paper? Oh, you. <laughs> Surprising. <laughs> so that was a big deal at the time, <clears throat> because this is the first time I experienced that actually a paper came out, and then three other papers came out to tell you why this is a crap paper. And so one of them was from Richard Henderson, and he basically just took eight of these particles and averaged them together, and he got this one. But then if you change the contrast, you suddenly got this ring, which was totally artificial. So this ring was already in the data, in the reference, basically. And also, if you take a protein of this size, that's the contrast that you should expect, and not the contrast that you got in these images. And so what turned out was that they basically took a tomography structure that they limited the resolution and used it as a reference to pick the particles. And then surprisingly, the averages that they got looked exactly like the, like the reference that they used. So there was really virtually no information in these images. It's all reference bias. And so <coughs> the take home message is, if you use template matching to pick your particles, you have to be careful because the templates that you put in is what you will get out. So a good idea is for the first time when you actually pick your particles, don't use templates, just do a uh, Gaussian blur or something, or you can even pick them from by hand if you want. And then you take these unbiased images, you classify them, and then you take the 2D classes that come out of that, and those you can then use as a template for your data set. But it comes out of your data, it's not something that you put in. Especially if you don't know what your protein looks like, it's a very bad idea to use a template. So if you do that, you know, it is, it is, I mean, it's like grainy, right? So mm -hmm. whichever you pick around it is going to be like different uh, densities of like black and white, black and white, which are all different. So once you classify and like go through high resolution, all these vectors which are created, connecting these, they're going to cancel out each other. So how can you theoretically get to high resolution with that like few noise thing? Because when you, when you take a reference and you pick, you will get something that looks somewhat similar to your reference. And now you have already pre-biased your data set. And then you also, I'm sure they also use the same templates to install the 2D classification. 
And so now you have bias at the peaking, and then you have bias at the 2D classification. At the end, they managed to get the structure to 1.9 angstrom from pretty much pure noise. Because a lot of software these days are really trained to try to avoid overfitting and noise fitting. These guys wrote their own software. He came out of atomic force microscopy. He had no idea what he was doing, and basically aligned everything to noise, refined to no yes. They also used extremely tight masks yeah. that bias. Are you going to talk about mass biasing? No. Yeah. Talk about it. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> so in addition to a reference, because when you're doing refinement, generally you start with a, a very soft spherical mask move to a tighter and tighter mass as refinement goes on, particularly if you're doing a focus classification. Particularly if you're doing a, a focus classification or refinement, you will be looking at one particular region, you're going to use a tight mask to exclude everything outside of that. However, there's a very strong bias, even if you're using two and a half maps, just by the effect of the mask. If you calculate an autocorrelation function of a white noise box, against the tight mass, you see that there's very strong peaks on autocorrelation function caused by the mask itself. And so in this case, they used an extremely tight mask and got the mask out in the end of their 3D refinement. And they also, I don't remember if they used it during the classification, but they used it multiple times. And so each time you use it, you continue to add a stronger and stronger effect. So when using focus classification, focus refinement approaches, you have to remember that the mask itself is information that you're imparting on the structure. So your mask similar to your templates, should come from your data, not from something else. So if you have a lower resolution 3D map, then you can use segmentation to get the region that you want to use. If you're using a high resolution mask, a very tight mask, say an atomic mask from a PDB that maybe one or two angstroms away from the edge of your atoms, that's going to impart an enormous amount of information and bias your structure. So, so for the that, Relyon has, um, I think you can go up to 10 angstroms in the mask. Um, is that typical? Like, what is the range that you use? So the larger the soft mask you use, the less effect it will have. We use generally a hard, a hard edge of 10 or 12 angstroms, and then a, a, a cosine edge of another 10 or 12 angstroms on top of that. So it's all like 20 angstroms away from the edge. When using a focus refinement on a small domain, you can't do that because you're going to take a lot of information from neighboring regions. And so it becomes empirical. You try a few different ones and see what works best. Okay, so once you have the averages, you make a 3D construction trying to get the three-dimensional, the third dimension out of your 2D data sets. And that used to be a huge problem. So before direct attack the cameras, before we got high resolution, this step was the most difficult step. We very often got incorrect maps because we had heterogeneous samples, we had all kinds of different conformations, they were all forced into the same 3D reconstruction. Very often because of uh, preferred rotation, we had missing views. And um, sometimes just trying to get a 3D map out of 2D averages is not a uniquely defined solution. You can get different solutions, but you get the same projections out of it. So this used to be really the most difficult part in Singapore directed microscopy. And so there was a technique very early on, which was called random conical tilt reconstruction. Has anybody in the room heard about this technique? A few remember. So this was the technique to begin with. And what was very nice about this technique was that you, you used it mostly for negative stains, negative stain specimens, because you had preferred orientation, so you had a single view. And so you took an image of your protein in one view and you got one projection. And now you took the same specimen area, you tilted it, and you took a second image, and now you have a tilt, so now you get different view of your specimen. And the nice thing about this is that this is uniquely defined. It's very, the only thing that you have to define is the in-plane or orientation, the in-plane rotation, which is very easy to get. And you knew the tilt that you used to take your images. So the orientation parameters were very well defined. So we could just simply take these projections and put them into three-dimensional space in exactly the correct orientation because we knew it. 
And then we just shine light through it, and we get a back projection, and that will carve out the three-dimensional density of our molecule. So what was so nice is because we really knew exactly what the orientation of the particles are, so this was a very reliable three-dimensional reconstruction method. The problem is that you need preferred orientations, so we typically did it with negative staining. Negative staining can introduce a lot of artifacts, especially flattening and all kinds of things. So that while the 3D reconstruction worked very well, the specimen preparation wasn't so great. But at least it was a very good method to get an initial idea of the 3D map of the 3D structure of the protein. Now in cryo it's very different because all your molecules are different orientations. And so for each of these molecules, you have to define five parameters, x, y, where in your image is your particle, and then the so-called three Euler angles, which will define the three-dimensional orientation of your molecule. So if you have a 2D projection, it's not so easy to get to these different values. And so one of the first ways to do this was called angular reconstitution. And the method was you had to start out with an uh, 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 anchor set which were three projections that were perpendicular to each other. So that was your anchor set, and then you could use further projections and basically build them into this initial anchor set. And that would give you a three-dimensional density map. The problem that you can immediately see is if you have a bunch of projections, how do you know which three projections are going to be perpendicular to each other? So it was very very prone to give you a wrong structure, so you could repeat it a few times, but at the time also computation was very slow, so it wasn't that easy. So very often this particular approach and the reconstitution ended up giving you incorrect initial density maps. And this problem has actually carried on until not too many years ago, and in particular because the initial model is very important because it actually will uh, decide the beginning of your refinement, Getting an initial wrong model had a huge impact on your final density maps. How, how did they know it was wrong? Though? They didn't. So that's why you had four structures that all look different, and everybody said, we have the right one. And as a reviewer, it was difficult to tell which one is the wrong structure, because there were no features that would tell you. There was no free R or anything like this. So it's very, very difficult at the time, and that's why so many wrong structures were actually published. It was a real problem. You just had no criterion to tell you. The only way was you had to follow what you what procedure they followed. And for example, when I looked at papers and they did angular reconstitution, I almost was certain that it was wrong. So when they did um, random conical tilt, I had much more confidence that they actually got it right. So it was a difficult time. So Singapore again had a horrible reputation because it was so easy to publish wrong structures. So these days, there's, and that's one of my really fascinating lessons, a tiny, tiny, tiny change in image processing can go make all the problems go away. And so this is, for example, um, a data set that was actually from Ridge. Um, so you have all these different 2D averages, and now you would have to figure out what are perpendicular averages and so on. But now there's a different method that gives you actually very reliable initial models out of these. And um, the method, the only change that happened is that you now use something that is called stochastic hill climbing. And so <coughs> what does this mean? So what you do once you have an initial structure, you have to refine the orientation parameters. And the way you do it, you calculate projections at defined orientations. And so you end up with a stack of reprojections from your model. So now you have your experimental to the average or the image or whatever you want to use. And now you take this and you cross correlate it with all these reference projections. And you end up with a, with a pile of cross correlation functions. And so what we used to do is we look at which one of these reference projections gives us the highest cross correlation with this one. And so it's clearly this one. So this is now what we assign to our experimental um, projection because that's the most similar uh, projection. So these are the orientation that this experimental projection should have. So we now assign, assign these uh, orientations to the experimental projections. And so we put it into space. And now we have one of our projections. 
And we do this with all our different experimental projections. We always compare it. We get the most similar one. We assign it. And that's actually called, um, so it, once you have this, we do the back projection. We get a new density model, the density map. And that becomes our new reference. And so we just cycle this until the resolution no longer improves. So this is called the steepest descent, because we always look at the best cross-correlating map. Again, the problem that you have with this is that these projections come from your initial density map. So if this is a wrong map, you actually bias it very strongly to this, because you always look for the best correlating to this particular map. If the map is wrong, you refine a wrong structure. And that has been a problem until not too many years ago. And that's another reason that we got so many wrong structures. So there's a very stupid solution to this. And so rather than doing steepest descent, we now use stochastic hill climbing. We do everything exactly the same. So we compare our experimental projections to these uh, reference projections. But now we no longer try to find the best correlating one. We just start at the first one, which is pretty poor. The next one has a better correlation. The third one has a worse correlation. So we actually stick with this one, because if we continue, it gets bad. So we just take the first one that gives us the best cross correlation and assign this as our new um, um, orientation parameters. And all the rest is the same. We do back projection and so on. However, because we now just look at the first good one rather than the overall best one, this actually gives you now a real chance to change the density map and to drift it away from what it used to be into something that might actually be better. And so this very simple change, not looking for the best one, but the first best one, now allows you to actually get very reliable initial models. It's a, a very simple thing, but it has really made a big difference to the field. And so now with this, we can get fairly re reliable initial 3D maps. And so when we do this, uh, we now do the 3D classification refinement. The issue with this is, again, reference bias, overfitting, and the all-important resolution number. And so who of you have looked at the resolution dispute on the, on the <laughs> who got sick and tired of it? <laughs> so this has been going on for years and decades. So the same thing that you have for 2D maps, that you can align your noise to the model, you can also do in 3D. You can, again, align noise to 3D features. And so you overfit the same idea. You end up with overfitting, and you can get spurious features that actually have nothing to do with the, with the protein. So, but these days, uh, all the programs rely on CryoSpark um, system. They're all really trained to try to avoid overfitting. So these days, we don't really have to worry too much about this anymore. Um, and now resolution. So how does resolution work? You have two half maps. And you calculate the similarity of these two maps over the resolution space. And so at low resolution, you get a very good um, correspondence. But the further you go out in resolution, the less and less these two maps correspond to each other. So now, what's the resolution of the map? But that's the problem. You have a continuous curve. So where do you cut the curve? And for the longest time, the way to cut the curve was at a British air correlation of half, which was the idea that at this point, the signal and the noise is about the same. So that's the resolution of our map. Now, a new Cartier came out by, from Richard Henderson. And this was the idea that the, you should cut it off at 0 0.143, which is currently what everybody uses. The basis for this is comes from extra crystallography, where, where a phase error of 60 degree is where you actually define that becomes noise. So if you still have exactly the same curve, but now you have a different resolution criteria, and suddenly all these rocks will have much better resolution. They look still exactly the same. So people can actually get very, very upset where exactly you're supposed to cut this curve and what criteria is the right one. It's, it's kind of silly. Um, but the reason why this actually didn't work initially is because a very important criteria for this criteria to work is that these two maps have to be independent. They have to be totally independent half maps. And that's not how it actually used to work. The way it worked was we had our particle stack. We aligned them to our reference. We got new orientation parameters. We calculated a refined map. 
this refined map became on a new reference and we cycled and cycled and cycled. And then in the end, we split the data set into two and calculated two half maps and calculated the Fourier correlation. And the problem with this is that these two half maps are not independent. They go through the entire processing all together and only the very last step to split them. So they're totally linked to each other. They're not independent half maps. So for the Fourier correlation 0.143 criteria to work, the two half maps have to be separate. So from the very beginning, you actually separate your data set. You align them to the reference. You get new ref uh, orientation parameters. And you cycle it separately. So now you have really separate maps. And now you can compare them. And that will, at this point, you can really cut them off at 0 0.143. And that is now called the gold standard um, Fourier correlation, which I think is stupid, because from the very beginning, that's the way you were supposed to do it. Uh, but now people insist that you do the gold standard, but there are different ways that you can actually calculate your resolution, not in the gold standard, where you can actually still do exactly this procedure, but you have to take precautions, but even this procedure can still give you the correct resolution. The, pro the thing you just have to do is to, you have to limit the resolution of your map, say, to six angstrom, and if your resolution actually goes out to four angstrom, it's still going to be OK, because the resolution from 64 angstrom was not used for alignment. So if this resolution is fine, it's actually still a correct resolution. So you don't really have to use the gold standard, but if you want to avoid fights with referees, use gold standards um, cross correlation. And that's also what is basically you now implementing pretty much every software program. So a repetition from what Rich already told you. I really never care about resolution. The number is totally meaningless, especially these days when you have local resolution. You actually know that the resolution will vary dramatically over different parts of your map. So resolution just helps you to get an idea whether you improve your map or not. However, what is really important is what you can see in the map. If you can see this feature at 3.5 or 3.2 angstrom, as long as you can clearly see the feature, the resolution number doesn't really matter. So just out of fun, if you have a resolution of 20 angstrom, what do you expect to see? So I have different domain blob. <laughs> <laughs> so the nice term is a molecular envelope. <laughs> so you see the proton envelope. So if you have 90 times, what do you expect to see? Hmm? Exactly. So if you see a 10 angstrom map and you see no tubes, the protein better be all beta sheets. So at 10 angstrom, you should see all the helices as tubes. At 4.8 angstrom, what do you expect to see? Other than her. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. At about 4.9 angstrom, beta sheets will start to separate. So now you can see in the visual stands. Um, <coughs> for angstrom, other than you. Anybody? Okay. What kind of side chains? All of them? The big aromatic side chains. At 4 angstrom, you start, should start to see blobs for tryptophan. So you're not going to see glycine or alanine. But tryptophan, so phenyl so that's a pretty good way for you to see what your map is actually like in different parts of your map. In certain parts, you can see all the side chains in different parts. It might be difficult to just see the envelope. So that's important. What can you see? And based on that, you can interpret what you actually see. And so this is another example from a paper where they looked at this. So and now I cut to my point, I have five minutes left to talk about validation. <laughs> and there's really not that much to talk about anyway. So this came out of this problem. And people had all these low resolution maps that all looked different and nobody knew how do you actually judge which one of these maps is correct. And so that was a problem. And so a bunch of experts actually met and tried to figure out for the field, what, how do we judge whether the density map is correct or not? And so out of this uh, meeting came a set of recommendations. One was that you should compare reference-free averages with the projections from your density map that you obtained. 
And so that's an example from the time. This is an anaphase um, complex. Again, it's a blob, a molecular envelope, has a bunch of proteins. And so what we did was we compared um, averages with raw particles and projections from the map. So all this looked pretty good. However, this is basically a drops the circle argument. What it tells you is that the 3D map is consistent with your 2D, ma 2D averages. It does not really tell you whether your 3D map is correct. So it's a very good test, but it doesn't by any mean mean that you, your density map is correct. In my opinion, something that I did mention, you should also look at the angular distribution of your projections. You want to make sure that pretty much all the areas are covered so that you don't have some areas that are totally undefined. So I think this is obviously a good thing to do. You should also check the angular distribution, but this doesn't tell you in any way whether your map is actually correct or not. So the second point I think is the strongest thing that you can do, it's a tilt analysis. Um, Peter Rosenthal and, and Richard Hamilton came up with this, and that's very clever. So what you do is you take an image of your specimen, and you just take your entire data set the same way, and then last three or four images, in addition to your zero degree averages, you also tilt the specimen just a little bit, five or 10 degrees. And so now you basically get, pick the same particles from the two images, from the untilted image and from the slightly tilted images. So now you have corresponding particle sets. And what you do is you take all your data set, you calculate an, a, a three-dimensional density map, and then you take these particles, align it to that, and so you get um, the matching projections as well as from the, the, the same particles from the tilted image. So now from the matching projections, you get the angle, of this, the angle, um, angle values. And because you know exactly how much you tilted it, all these angles between these matching projections should be a tilt angle. If this density is correct, these two should always be separated by the same tilt value. So it's a very simple way to figure out whether this is actually correct. If this is a total noise ball, there's going to be variable, totally variable uh, assignments of, of um, angles to these uh, projections. And then the problem becomes again a little bit, OK, now you get this distribution. And you can see some of yours are really totally misassigned. But a bunch of them actually cluster to kind of the correct um, angle uh, assignment. So that's what you would assign is actually a decent density map. Um, that's just different representation and spaces in your plot. But the problem is that these are all published data. And you can see some of them work very what is it? Some of them work very well. So rotavirus is a huge particle. You assign pretty much every particle in data set correctly. But other ones, for example, this ATPase, um, not that many, actually, almost only half the particles actually were properly assigned. But it was still a decent data set. So it's kind of the same problem as the resolution. Where do you take the cutoff that you think the density map is correct or not? Um, <coughs> and so but the fact that when you tilt that, then you, this, this uh, carbon layer like moves relative to the, to the copper. And that so this is probably the reason why you get these kind of things. Because in certain, if you have charging, some actually move a lot, and others don't move so much. So the idea is that most of them should actually work, and the outliers might well be charging effects, other effects. So, but in the end, the idea is that the cutoff is about 60% of the particle. If 60% of the particles are clustering in one area, that is actually going to be a decent amount. It's not absolute, so this is an example. This is what you would expect from random assignments. This is a very nice density map. You get a, really, a lot of particles that get the right angle. This one looks actually not so great, but you still have a bunch of particles that are actually well assigned. So this density map was actually OK. It just didn't look very good. So again, it's not a perfect thing, but you would expect to get a fairly decent number of the particles um, being correct. And this is a very good um, very thing to do. There's a web page where you can do this. And now it's actually even part of the, um, what's it called? It's the 
the EMDB where you actually can put your data in there and they will calculate for you. So I think that's a really the nicest way. If you're uncertain about your map, that's a very good way to look at it. But again, in most cases, your maps will have all the helices, you will see tubal density. So this is really only when you are very much at the beginning of your project, you get a very low resolution map and you have no idea whether there's anything to do with your protein or not. But this is a very good technique. So I think it's really great. It also establishes handedness, which is great. And then goes to all the FSC. Again, I think it's certainly not bad if you do it. Um, so it's OK, but I don't think it's critical. That's the way FSC should have been calculated for all, for all, for the entire time. And then there's another technique that I usually don't talk about is randomized phases. It's a very elegant way to do it, but I don't think it's implemented in any software package that I know of. So if you want to look at this, you can look at this paper, but it's very rarely used because it's just not implemented. And well, do you know is it implemented anything? Which random phase? If you just basically randomize the phase at a certain resolution, then? Uh, there's a shortcut, but it's built into Reliant. Reliant has it? Yeah, the, the post-processing algorithm uses this exact approach. Oh, OK. So that's their way to prevent overfitting? Yeah. OK, so I usually don't look at this. <laughs> Well, the FSC you get from Reliant is the result of after you use the fit, using phase randomization beyond the particular resolution, you go back one. You can see that they draw a cutoff, and in your, you often, if you look at the FSC, there's a dip right after it. Mm -hmm. That's because of the effect of the phase randomization. But all, the CryoSpark, I'm pretty sure, does it as well. Oh, okay. That the, if you look at the output of CryoSpark, you get multiple curves that superimpose. <coughs> Look at which one it is. One of them is the phase randomized corrected trace. Oh, I should look at this. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so all this is already implemented, so you don't have to look at it. <laughs> but um, so cancel this. <laughs> so I'm a biologist. I've always been a biologist. IEM was developed by a lot of physicists, so they used a lot of um, mathematical ways to look at. I think for us as biologists, the, the most important thing is, first of all, do we see the structural elements that we want to see? But also, I think it's important to evaluate all your structures which, with what is actually known biological about your complex or your prototype. And so that's just one example where we did the xenophase uh, complex, promoted complex, and we did antibody labeling of all the different subunits. And so that's what we got, and we know from um, uh, used to hybrid, they had a kind of an organization map of what APC should look like. And when we compared um, our labeling with this, it was really fitting very well. So any kind of information that you can get from the literature will help you assess whether your map and your structure actually makes sense or not. So there's all kinds, of uh, mass, uh, cross the mass spec has become a very powerful technique. If you can use it, that's going to really help you to, to look at um, making sense whether your structure actually satisfies the cross links or not. It will really help you to satisfy whether the structure is correct or not. And so in the end, if you have atomic structures of complexes, if those structures actually fit into the density map, that's a very strong indication that your structure is correct. So I'm going to skip over this. It's just docking really helps you. This was at the same time, this was a negative stain EM map of the same protein as this one, which was determined by cryem. Everybody loved this map because this was just very old technique, negative stain, low resolution. But in our map, you could actually fit the crystal structures of this individual domains right into this map, which you couldn't do with this density map, even though this was cryo in higher resolution. And in the end, when the exit structure came out at the time, it fit very nice at this low resolution. So if your structure doesn't accommodate known crystal structures, you have to be you have to have, give it a second thought. So back to this just very quickly. So this was in the early 2000s. You had these four structures, all look different. So in 2011, another structure came out of this complex, and now it was at 11 angstrom just not good enough that you could see all the helices. <laughs> so it was kind of a problem, <coughs> but they tried to publish this, but there was so much history about this protein with all these wrong structures, 
that they did everything they could think of to validate this density map. And so the first thing was they, they knew that the transmembrane domain is similar to potassium channels, which have an structure. So they looked very carefully at this density to make sure that they have density where you would expect to have um, orthogeneities. So they saw that, so there was good support that this might actually be an okay map. And then they did what was recommended. They did um, projections from the density map and compared this with reference pre and reference based to the averages and single molecules. So this all worked out, so this was fine. And then they did the tilt pair, and that was really quite remarkable. So this was a new map which actually now really uh, it, it, it focuses very nicely into a certain area. And these three other maps that were published before are totally random. So there was nothing in these density maps that really represented the structure. So just to give you an idea how bad the situation was at the time when you really couldn't validate the structures that you published. And then they did something else. They actually calculated that the, they used the same data to calculate the map with different programs, Emacs, Sparks, Imagic, and Reliant, and then they cross-correlated and saw how far these maps were actually uh, comparable, and that was about to get an extra. So that's what they did, but it's tedious if you do the same structure with four different software packages, but that again was seven years ago now. So then uh, in 2015, they finally got a structure by 4.7 angstrom, and at this point, they could actually at least follow most of the backbone. And so now you have kind of a fold of the protein. And then more recently, or the most recent one is actually the data coming out from Rich, which was able to get a structure at 3.5 angstrom. And what is so nice these days is you're not only getting a single structure, but by this 3D classification, you can get all kinds of different confirmations. Based on, based on the situation, the condition where they have a ligand band or different buffers. So at this point, this was really an amazing classification feat, and that now really gives you real biology. So in this case, this is more typical of what you can do. Maybe sometimes you only get to four angstroms, but at this resolution, when you can build backbones, I feel that map validation is not that important anymore because you get, at this kind of resolution, a very pretty good idea whether the structure is correct or not. And so that's all I have to say. This is actually being done quite frequently. <coughs> so they're more or less, so especially for maximum likelihood calculations, you actually have to get a model for the noise that you expect. The problem is you don't really quite know what the noise looks like in real electron I mean, It's not just white noise, it's not just random noise. There's short noise and all kinds of different noises. So you can try to get a simulation of what the image looks like. You can definitely apply CTF to your image to make it more. But it's very difficult to get a really good noise model for EM images. And that's what um, maximum likelihood is struggling with a little bit these days. So I, I imagine it's, it's a, it could be some validation tool, but it can also be an educational tool. Right? Because you, especially when the, the particles are very small, so the molecular weight of the complex is small, you yeah. can't So people, yeah, so the problem is, of course, it all depends on exactly what microscope you use, how coherent is your source, you have a cold emitter, you have a warm emitter, how thick is your ice layer to use a support film, what camera do you use, do you do super resolution, it will all affect how the image will look in the end. And you can try to model all of this, and some people do it. I think most of people just use white noise, right? So I agree it's very important, it's very educational to look at these things. Because it works a little bit differently. You can do this, you can do exactly that, and that's what people do to validate the model against the map. 
you do exactly that. So mostly you have these two half maps that you calculate anyway. You model it to one map, and then you use the other map as your R free to calculate your R free. The problem is with single particle map calculation, you basically each image will have different information because of different orientation. It's not like every image um, contributes to the same. So if you just take 5% of the images out, if you just take the best 5% of the images out, what are you going to learn? If you take the worst 5% of the images out, it's not going to affect very much. I mean, in the beginning, like just so the, if you take out 5% of your micrographs, then that's pretty random, right? But it's not, it's not going to give you the same information as an all free, because, so, a lot of people thought about this, and it's not working. You can you cannot use that, but you can you can do this basically for the what it, what it validation of the model that you get in the end. There it works. There you can exactly take the images out, and then you can compare. If okay, we're going to convert, we're going to bring Rich up here. We're going to let Tom sit as well. Um.